Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Sammy. Wherever you went. No, today it's about, it's about a test. And have any of you had the, the privilege of taking a standardized test? Anybody? Oh, yeah, I mean, SAT, ACT could count in there too, but I, I'm talking about those goodies that they just, they just want you to take because when you're in school. And Scott's nodding his head because he's like, I know I have to give those out every year, and it's wonderful, isn't it? I remember one year, I think it was first grade, the first year I took it out, no, PA, we have PSSAs. I'm from Indiana, and in Indiana we had I-STEP, the I-STEP test that you had to take multiple times. And the first time I took it, I think I was in first grade. It was early on, and I was excited about it because if I did well in I-STEP, I could be in, and I don't remember what the acronyms stand for, now I could be in the stretch program. And I wanted to be in the stretch program. My sister was in the stretch program, and I wanted to be in that too. It was for the, pe- the kids that did well on I-STEP. And I said, I should be in it instead of her. I told my mom and dad that when she got in, because I said, I like to stretch. I like to work out. She doesn't like to do any of that. She just likes to sit around the house. So that should be me. But I was so excited to to do well, to, to get in there, because it meant every Thursday or every other Thursday, I don't remember which now, but all these times each week in the afternoon where you got to go away with students to a different school and to do different like science experiments and all this cool stuff that usually in elementary school, at least at that time, we didn't get to do too much of. So I was excited and I took the tests. But I didn't do that well on all of it. I did really well for two-thirds. And then the last third, it just tanked. I did horrible. It just dropped off a cliff. And then, in fact, the teacher, and my mom's a first-grade teacher too, the teacher called my mom and was a little concerned and wondered, well, I don't know what happened because Josh was doing so well for part of the test. And then all of a sudden, it was just awful. I don't understand what happened that last part of the test, that last third of the test. And my mom asked me because it didn't, it didn't add up for her either as a teacher. She'd have, she would see these tests too and it didn't make sense. And I told her, well, my arm got tired of filling in all those circles. So about two-thirds of the way through, I decided I was going to fill in every single one D. Which is, if you've looked at like statistics of multiple choice tests, D is the worst of any of the four answers to keep picking. So I just went D, 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 D. I just thought, I'll just get this done with quick. So I didn't get in stretch that year. I was so bummed. I had to wait a few more years before I got to get into the stretch program. But, you know, tests can tell us a number of different things. They're used to, I mean, they're used to show expertise, to show knowledge, used to assess intelligence or our aptitude, they can show the progress you've made, you've been making through a course or through something, or, or they can even be, for the benefit of the test taker, almost exclusively also, to, to teach them something through the process of taking the test or to, to, to maybe grow in some area, maybe even in confidence, to grow in some area through the process of taking this test. And we're going to Genesis 22 today. If you would open up your Bible to Genesis 22, and it's about this test. This test we see in the Old Testament. It's a, it's a tough story. This is a hard story to read, especially now that I have kids. It's a hard story to read through. But I think it's so important, such an important one for us to explore. I mean, this, this story that, that some 3,700 years old still speaks truth to us today. Well, for one, it points forward to the time of Christ, to the time when when God gave his son as a substitute for us so that we might be spared. Where Jesus, we were just singing about this a little bit ago, where Jesus gave his life so that we might live. And it's got definite tie-ins there too. And and I also think that it, it connects not just that place for us, but also in our day-to-day lives. And there's so much truth in there for us right now. Let's read together starting at verse 1 of Genesis 22. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, 
Here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In this passage, it's, it's one that's about trust and trust and faithfulness and blessing. The trust, first off, Genesis 22, it shows us that, that trust, especially trusting God, is sacrificial. And there's tension in this story. What would Abraham do? What's going to happen? Is, is he, is he going to gonna follow through? Is he, who's he going to trust through this? Is he going to trust the blessing he has itself in Isaac, or is he going to trust the giver of blessings? You can feel this tension building as they're on their journey, wondering what's going to take place. Is he going to go through with it? Is he going to do the unthinkable? Is God going to step in and save him? What's going to happen to Isaac? Is Isaac going to go along with this too? And we see this picture coming up. And, and when, I, when I read this now, I feel this, this anguish as I think of myself in the place of Abraham. And now having two kids of my own, having a son of my own, and Thinking, well, what would I do if that were me? Would I listen to God and trust him or would I cut and run? Because I didn't want to lose my son. I didn't know what was going to happen. And still we see Abraham trusting. But this was his son. This was his son. And not just, not just his son, but this was the fulfillment of so many blessings of God. For Abraham was called by God when he was 75 years old. And for 25 years, he and Sarah were promised by God they would have a child. They would have a son. For 25 years, they waited, wondering. And Abraham was 100 years old before Isaac was born. They got all through all those years of waiting, of trusting God. Sometimes they trusted him better than others in those times. But trusting that God would come through and then God brought them this child of the promise, Isaac. And everything seemed good. Isaac represented God's goodness, represented God's faithfulness. All that, all that Abraham had hoped for rested in this kid. And here's God asking him to sacrifice his son, to take his life. 
It just makes no sense. And Abraham wasn't the only one that needed trust then. How old do you, th- do you think Isaac was in this story? How old do you think? Shout, shout out some numbers. What do you think? 12? 8, 10? Yeah. I mean, the, the picture we have set is this innocent, in my mind, has always been this innocent child that just will follow his dad anywhere. Maybe at the 10, 12, maybe at the oldest. But some early Jewish traditions, they say Isaac could be as old as 37 years old. And I, and I don't know about that age. I know. That's older than me. Well, is that possible? <laughs> but but this, the picture here of Isaac, it, well, he's someone that's smart enough to know something's not right. To, you know, to, to wonder, well, where's... Where's the offering for? Where's the lamb for the sacrifice? And he's strong enough to carry all the firewood they're going to need up there. So, you know, he's got some meat on his bones. He's, probably, he's at least a teenager. And here's Isaac, too. We, we don't hear in the story of him arguing back and forth with Abraham. We don't hear of him. He, he, could, he could have taken his dad. Abraham was 100 when Isaac was born. If it was 16 years later, he's not a spring chicken. He's 116 years old, and he's got this 16-year-old boy, you know, who's, who's busy, who's used to doing hard labor. Isaac trusted. He trusted fully in what, what his dad was doing. I think that's such an incredible picture right there. And, and we see this trust in Abraham, too. And we see this trust in Abraham right at, from the get-go in verse 5. And I, I find this astounding. Verse 5, Abraham says, we will worship and then we will come back to you. There's this trust and this confidence in what God's going to do even at the very beginning. Abraham trusted it. He trusted that God, the God who was faithful to give him this son, to keep his promises so well that that God would remain faithful in this moment too. That God was going to be there with him. And that one way or another, God was going to make it so that Abraham and Isaac were walking back down that mountain together. He didn't know how it was going to take place. But he trusted what God was going to do. And God showed up. God showed up in a big way. Providing a substitute for Isaac at the last moment. And then he, then he renewed that covenant with Abraham right at the end, re- reiterating those promises that he had made to Abraham so many years ago. He's going to make him into a great nation, a blessing for all the other nations on earth too. And this passage is about trust, faithfulness, and blessing. And we, we see here that God is faithful to provide. In fact, the name given to the place and the the, the Lord will provide, and the, the way you might know that better, the phrase Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh Hira, God will provide, the Lord will provide. Because Abraham saw God provide in such an incredible way, saving his son's life in that place. And that same God that provided for Abraham is the same God that provides for us too. The God who showed himself faithful then is the God who was faithful still to us and with us today. But it still makes me wonder why. Why this test? Why something so extreme, something so harsh? I mean, we can say it's, it's so that Abraham could show himself to be, himself to be trusting, himself to be faithful. But doesn't God already know his heart? Wouldn't God have already known what was in Abraham's heart before this action and through the years that he had seen, he had walked beside Abraham and had seen him trusting in God? I think there's incredible importance in the very act of surrender. That act itself of release, of letting go. And the importance for Abraham, it was, it, it was to show... For himself, too, where his priorities were. It was for, to show for himself where his trust truly lied. And it was also to show for him for sure 
once more of God's faithfulness because seeing God come through in such a way, wouldn't that just cement for you in your mind, well, that God's going to come through no matter what I face. And wouldn't that do that for Isaac too, the next generation there? Abraham had, had seen God show up time and time again. Isaac had heard of those stories, but maybe not had, had seen it firsthand that much. But this experience for him would have been one where he sees God providing, where he sees God showing up. Place their focus squarely, squarely on the giver of blessings and not on that blessing itself. For Abraham, he trusted fully. And that trust was rewarded because he trusted that God was going to be the one that would come through. And unless we're willing to lay down that thing we hold so tightly to, we can miss out on the blessing that God wants to give us. Because we can be so focused on what's right there. It's something interesting I read is that Abraham, he doesn't notice there's a ram there before. Does the ram just show up out of nowhere? Or was there a ram there before when they went up the mountain? But Abraham's focus was on Isaac. But when he hears the angel, his focus is just taken off of Isaac and put onto God, and he's able to see what God's providing in that moment. And so often we can hold so tightly, we miss. All of you, you should have a, at the table or under your chairs, if you're not at a table, a nice, maybe not this wrinkle, but a piece of paper there. I encourage you to, to take that paper and take a pen that you have there. And think of what you need to lay down. If you don't have one, feel free to raise your hand and one of our ushers will, will get one to you. What do you need to lay down? Write it on that paper. What are you holding on so tightly to? That you can't take hold of what God's offering you. Even if it's just initials, something's where you, you know what it is and no one else does, that's fine too if you're nervous about it. But I encourage you to write that thing down on the paper because we all have those things. I know our minds wander first toward the, the bad stuff. We think that thing, it could be our pride or... Or it could be our selfishness. It could be some secret sin that we have or some addiction that no one knows about. And it could be one of those things too. But it, it could be something that by itself is very good. But it's just out of order in our lives where it's become the thing that our focus is solely on. And we can't see God because we're so focused on this thing. Whatever that thing is, we need to entrust it into God's care. Abraham laying Isaac down on the altar, he was entrusting the life of his son to God. And God came through and brought new life and brought healing. I'd encourage all of you that we have an altar set up here that we can take some time to kneel and pray if you want to, but I invite you to, to come up and lay whatever that thing is, that Isaac of yours to lay that down on the altar.